Okay, time's 11 o'clock. Let's get started. Here. So all of you should have received your assignment number one back uh, with my grade on it. Uh, we will discuss that shortly. Uh, today we will continue in the bootstrap section. Uh, um, I do not have assignment number two ready. Uh, hopefully I will by our next class period. Are there any questions before we start talking about the assignment number one? Okay. And unfortunately, I forgot to pull up the answer key. Sorry. So first of all, when you uh, view an assignment of mine that I have graded, this is what you should see, is something like this, where basically I have tracked all of my changes and they will be in red, underlined, on your assignment. Now, for some of you, when you first open up in Word, it may not look like that. And if that's the case, please make sure to do the following. Under the Review tab, click on All Markup. That needs to be shown because what I've done is marked up your document. And also for Show Markup, make sure that Ink and Inserts and Deletions are actually checked. If they're not, you will not necessarily see my red comments throughout your assignment. Any questions about that? Okay. So, um, first of all, uh, hopefully all of you have taken a look at the answer key. Um, I want to point out something here where I made a mistake. And that is, if you remember, there was like a, a check value that I gave in the assignment that uh, gave you what the, what the first observation of the second simulated data set was. Um, Oddly, no one brought it up to me that that wasn't quite right, um, at least the way that I had simulated the data. Uh, I'm sorry. It may have been right for some people, uh, depending upon how they put their data into matrices, because everyone did it in a different way than I did it. Uh, I'm not saying that your way was wrong, it's just the way that I had structured the data was differently from your, yours, I wasn't really anticipating that. Um, but at least with respect to the way that I had structured my data, uh, what I actually gave you was the first observation from the first simulated data set because here my R was set to 1 for first data set. And at least the way that I had structured it, uh, basically I had um, two columns in a data uh, or matrix or a data frame. I had two columns in a data frame, one was X, one was Y first 20 observations of the first data set, the next 20 observations of the second data set, and so on. That's how I, how I had structured it. And the way that you can pick out certain particular data sets is to uh, specify particular rows. And when I was actually writing up the answer key, and thus also giving you the, what was supposed to be the first observation from the second data set, I had forgot to change this little value here from R equal 1 to R equal 2 to pick off the 21st through the 40th rows. Um, so anyway, so because of that, uh, despite my best efforts, uh, your, all of your numerical results were a little bit differently from, different from mine because of that, because you were essentially applying your stuff to different data sets than I had, which then, of course, then made it more difficult for me to grade. Oh well. Um, so sorry about that. Um, you know, what so, some of you were doing, which I found kind of surprising, is that it was obvious in the way that you had structured the data that um, you were giving me the first observation from the first data set. And I, I don't know why you didn't even mention that. Well, you know, in the, in the write-up for the, for the assignment itself, I said second data set. Well, I, I'm not for sure why you didn't bring it up. But if you, if you see something like that in the future, please bring it up, because I do make mistakes sometimes. Um, okay, so now the most mis kind of problem on the 
on the assignment involves something like this. Suppose you had a, a true confidence level, uh, an estimated true confidence level from the 10,000 simulated data sets of 0.952. So again, R would be 10,000. Suppose, again, the goal was 95% confidence. Why is this not correct to say this is a conservative interval? It's pretty much about 0.95, and how do we make that judgment? Well, that's where we had that discussion about, well, what is the expected range? So for R equal 10,000, the expected range was 0.9444 to 0.9556. I believe this is on page MC.34. Now, this is essentially the expected range with 95% confidence, uh, meaning that you know, if I were to do 99% confidence, it would be a little bit larger. So, you know, if I had an estimated true confidence level of 0.956, that wouldn't worry me. If I have point, even 0.96, I might be okay with it. You know, this is the expected range with a certain level of confidence associated with it. Um, you know, longs is not occurring, you know, uh, in terms of a, of a pattern. Let's say if I'm doing lots of m sets of Monte Carlo simulations where I'm always about 0.96 all the time, then I'm not, not worried. Okay? So you have to take into account the, this expected range, the simulation variability that one would have when you're making a judgment, is the interval conservative or liberal, or perhaps you cannot say e uh, either of them. Any questions about that? So uh, another thing that I saw, which I would generally not take off points for, was inefficient R code. Now, obviously, some of you maybe have only been using R for a very short period of time, so you know I expect that kind of stuff. Um, but I, 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 I won't take off points for inefficient R code unless, for example, let's say you had to do R equal 500 Monte Carlo simulations, and you decide to have 500 separate lines in your program where you simulated one data set at a time. I would take off for that, okay? But in other uh, more realistic cases, I wouldn't. Uh, still, I usually will try to uh, make some kind of comment in your code saying, okay, this, is, this isn't efficient. You can do it a lot easier maybe this way instead. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> the reason why I do that is because you know you need to learn how to program the most in, a, in the most efficient manner. Uh, obviously, I've been being, being I've had connections with R and, and S now for 20 years, so I've kind of been able to practice my coding and figure out what is the best way to do this stuff. And I've read a lot of other people's code, so I know what is the best way to do stuff. Um, so always make sure you take a look at my answer key and see how I approach the coding process. Uh, because there's a chance there that you might see something. It's like, oh, yeah, it was a lot easier doing it that way. I should have did it that way instead. And so that eventually when you do your research and you're doing some Monte Carlo simulations on your own, uh, you'll be able to make your code more readable. You'll also maybe make your code run faster. Um, also, with respect to notation, please use the notation that we use in our notes. So, for example, <coughs> if you are talking about the population mean, don't, talk, don't necessarily use mu, the letter M, and also, what was the other one that I saw? Actually spill out mu. Um, don't you interchange those three symbols throughout your write-up. This is something that 218 students do. Okay? You know, this is a graduate level course. Use the correct mathematical notation. And that might mean that you have to use the equation editor to do stuff. Um, also, and then lastly, is the, you know, your use of English. Um, now, I know obviously not everyone's a, not 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 everyone here is a native English speaker, but you know we are doing instruction using English. You need to write complete sentences. Your sentences need to be make sense. Okay, 
because if they don't make sense, you know, what's going to happen when you get a job and you have to write a report for your, let's say, your supervisor on your job and he reads it and he sees it's kind of a broken English. Well, he's not going to think much of your job performance. Well, you'd be lucky if you keep your job. Um, and, you know, obviously you're going to have to write, you know, mostly you're going to have to write dissertations here. You know, your advisor is not going to accept something that, that where the English is, is, is very poorly done. Uh, you know, there are some options on campus to improve your English if you need it. Uh, come talk to me if, 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 if you want to. Okay. Okay, so I don't have any other specific questions about the assignment or any other specific comments about the assignment itself. Uh, if you have a uh, question about why I, if you have a question about how to do a particular problem, please feel free to ask at this time. So if you have a question on why I took off a certain number of points, please come talk to me individually. Are there any questions? Okay. So uh, that then leads us to page 11 in the notes. Okay. So what are we going to be doing with the bootstrap? Well, you know, the bootstrap is most useful in situations where um, where standard inference procedures don't work. You know, if, if you know that you're working with something where a, a large sample, let's say normal distribution is going to work well, you know, most people are going to say to you, why would you want to, you know, take resamples, or why, why would you want to use the bootstrap? Because it's a, basically a Monte Carlo simulation technique that will take a little bit longer than simply using a normal approximation. And that is true. And so, you know, the bootstrap works best when you know, for when standard inference procedures don't work, or maybe, you know, a large sample normality just doesn't hold. Uh, the problem, though, then in a classroom situation like this is that, you know, there's a, uh, there's a lot of diversity amongst these procedures uh, where the bootstrap works well. And it often takes a lot of a, a long introduction to those procedures uh, to show you why, indeed, the bootstrap might be the best approach. Uh, give you a quick example. When I would teach a whole semester on the bootstrap, uh, I would uh, talk a little bit about my own research. And in order to, uh, for students to understand the bootstrap part, I have to do a day introduction to the, the non-bootstrap part first so that you can see well, why the bootstrap was needed. And so because of this reason, because that we only have about three or four weeks that we're going to spend on the bootstrap, we are going to concentrate on standard, uh, concentrate on applications of the bootstrap where standard inference procedures do work. Um, so, you know, it might be questionable whether or not someone would actually want to use the bootstrap in that kind of a situation. But what, what's nice is, especially in a classroom setting, is that it gives us a, a place where we can make comparisons. So, you know, if I get a p-value from, from, you know, doing a regular old t-test with the t-distribution, the p-value is 0 0.06, and the bootstrap gives me 0 0.07, okay, that tells us that, yeah, the procedure's a larger degree, which is um, good, often. And it also, as I've mentioned before, my, my notes here are, are, are basically um, uh, taken somewhat from my STAT 950 course. In that particular course, I use Davis and the Hinckley's bootstrap book. This is probably the number one book out there for the bootstrap, even despite its age. Uh, please note that that is, uh, it can be a hard book to read at times. Um, and also there are some quirks about the book, such as instead of saying they have 1 minus alpha times 100% confidence intervals, they have 1 minus 2 times alpha times 100% confidence intervals. So all that means is that whenever you see, let's say, uh, if you, in a non-bootstrap setting, where you see every, whenever you see a quanta from a normal distribution, instead of having the usual Let's say t minus, uh, I'm sorry, the, the 1 minus alpha divided by 2 quantile. Instead, they'll have the 1 minus alpha quantile. You still have 95% confidence intervals wherever you need them. It's just alpha is 0 0.025 versus 0 0.05. Okay. 
I decided to keep that those some of those some of those quirks, uh, or at least the, the most important ones, uh, so that if you do read that book, um, uh, you won't uh, you you'll get a head start on understanding what they're doing. Okay, so we're going to talk about the non-parametric bootstrap. We're going to focus primarily on that in our short section on the bootstrap. Here's the setting that we have. So we have Y1 through Yn are IID with a particular CDF that we just simply call F. And what we're interested in doing is estimating a parameter theta. Maybe it's the population mean, for example. And we're going to estimate it by a statistic that we're going to call it T. Perhaps that could be the sample um, mean. Now, as we, as we saw in, 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 uh, previously in this bootstrap section, you know, what really drives statistical inference is understanding uh, the sampling distribution of your statistic itself. Okay? And so what we're going to be looking at, a little bit modified version of that, we're going to be looking at the distribution of t minus theta. So you can kind of think of it as almost like a centered um, uh, distribution, centered at zero. Um, and this CDF is going to be denoted by G. Now it's going to be helpful at times, especially when we're uh, introducing the bootstrap, to use a little bit of a different notation here, or more formal, I guess you could say. So my CDF, you know, maybe you might call it, let's say, G of T, but we're going to say G of T given F to emphasize that our y's are essentially coming from the distribution f. You'll see why that's important to do shortly. Then we can also talk about, let's say, a 1 minus alpha quantile from the distribution of t minus theta. And that quantile, as you might expect, is denoted by then the inverse function of that CDF, so g inverse. And f hat is going to be our EDF. That's how we're going to estimate f. This, was, this is what makes this non-parametric versus parametric. Okay. So let's talk about deriving, you know, the, I guess you could say the most basic confidence interval out there for theta. So, you know, think back to your days when you first saw the derivation for a confidence interval for a population of mean when you look at the uh, following uh, set of equations here. So, what, you, what, we, what we're going to do, so you can say step one here, is we're going to start by uh, giving a probability statement. So I'm going to put t minus theta in the middle. And since I know the corresponding distribution for t minus theta, I can then write a particular alpha quantile as a lower bound, and a 1 minus alpha quantile as an upper bound. So if we had maybe perhaps a symmetric distribution for t minus theta, you know, here is my uh, g inverse 1 minus alpha given f. And here is my g inverse alpha given f as well. The area in between these two is 1 minus 2 alpha. The area on the tails is alpha. Then what we'd like to be able to do is get just theta in the middle of this inequality expression with inside the probability. So step two then is that we subtract a t from all parts of it. So now I have a negative t here. I have a negative t here. Step three, I don't want negative theta. I want theta itself. So we multiply through by negative one. So now I just have theta in the middle. Notice my inequalities change directions. And then step four, since we usually like inequalities in the other directions, we just flip what was on the right-hand side and move it over to the left-hand side and do the same thing for what was on the left-hand side and put it on the right-hand side. So notice then what we have here is the 1 minus alpha quantile now is on the left side. The alpha quantile is on the right side. So to emphasize that further, the upper bound, the upper quantile is on the left, which then will help you form your lower bound for your interval. And then your lower quantile is on the right, which will find your upper quantile. I'm sorry, your upper bound. Does that 
is everyone comfortable with that? Because I w wouldn't be surprised if some of you have never seen that happening before. Uh, so for example, if you derived a confidence interval for a population mean with a T distribution, you know, you don't see that happening. Why? Well, because the T distribution is symmetric. And so it doesn't matter if you're saying lower, the lower quantile or the upper quantile. Okay, well good, I'm glad you guess you're all comfortable with that. Um, so, so now we, we have a certain probability that this holds true. Okay? But if we were to actually calculate them in the confidence interval, we replace then the statistics with their observed values, and then this is what we get for then a confidence interval. So instead of having uppercase T, I have a lowercase T there. The lowercase T is my observed value. So that's my confidence interval. You can say this is the most basic confidence interval that you know, one, one could derive. Okay. Is everything in that expression something that we can calculate without making any assumptions? Well, I can observe T. What about this quantile? Can I get that? Without making any assumptions. Can I calculate it exactly? Excuse me? Well, let's say I give you alpha 0 0.05. Can I calculate it? The answer is no, because f is unknown. Okay. So, hopefully intuitively, then you, you're probably thinking, well, why don't we just replace f with an estimate? And that, as I kind of mentioned last time, is exactly all the bootstrap does. That's it. It's what's often referred to as the plug-in principle. So we're going to replace F with its corresponding estimate. And this is what's called then the basic bootstrap confidence interval. So if you remember those, mo those um, uh, when we were looking at those uh, trellis plots the other day, or I guess last time, um, that's what the basic bootstrap confidence interval was that you saw in those trellis plots. So you still might be wondering though, well, Okay, that's nice that I can actually calculate that because everything's based upon my sample itself, but how would I actually calculate then um, this CDF, essentially, based upon having my sample coming from F hat rather than F? How would I actually calculate this, this, this CDF and thus then the corresponding quantile? Okay, well, it's going to take a little bit of time to... to fully explain that. So what do these quantiles represent? Well, let's let y1 star through yn star be a random sample from f hat. Now remember, we typically think of y1 through yn, without the stars, as a random sample from f. So to, to differentiate the two, I'm going to use the star. This is, a, a, this is used throughout uh, 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 the bootstrap area. I guess you could say people use stars to represent then uh, the random variables uh, that have the for, for, for the CDF uh, f hat. Um, it has corresponding observed values of little y1 star through little y1n. So then the statistic of interest, then if we're taking samples from f hat rather than f, also becomes a t star as well. Then, with an, uh, with an observed value of little t star, then my g of t of f hat, that CDF, well, that's a CDF of t star minus t. So t from your original sample. Now, you might be wondering, and we'll talk about this shortly, well, why is it t star minus theta? Well, you can kind of think of of this, this T then, at, well, think of it this way. I think this is the easiest way to think about it. Uh, think of like an analogy. Theta is to F as T is to F hat. Theta is to F as T is to F hat. Now think back to taking an ACT or, or SAT test. 
but they didn't ask you that kind of analogy on that exam. Okay. So how do we actually then calculate then um, these quantiles? So, so we have an idea of what then the CDF is actually representing. So it's representing the, the, the CDF of T star minus T. How do we actually calculate the quantiles? Well, in the non-parametric case, almost always you're left with having to use the Monte Carlo simulation. That's why we talk about Monte Carlo simulation first in this class, and now we're talking about the bootstrap. Because the Monte Carlo, the bootstrap typically always relies on you using Monte Carlo simulation to get at stuff like quantiles from a distribution. So let's think about, just to make sure you're, you're seeing how, maybe how this would be done, let's think about how we would estimate a quantile from g of t given f without the hat. How would we use Monte Carlo simulation to estimate a quantile from that distribution? Well, what we would do is take, let's say, capital R samples from f. We did this a lot from the, in the Monte Carlo simulations section. So what we would do is take, let's say, for my, my first sample, uh, y11 through y1n, so the first subscript there represents the first sample, and that will give us t1. We do this then also for the second sample as well, and we go all the way down to the rth sample, and get t sub capital R. then as long as capital R is large, we know that if I were to essentially take then the 1 minus alpha observed quantile from T1 minus theta to TR minus theta, those values, uh, I will get a good estimate. So just to make sure you see how this would be done, uh, you know, let's say that, oh, do I want to do Yeah, I guess I, I guess we'll do this. Suppose R is a thousand, and this might not be enough depending upon what your alpha is. Let's say that alpha is a 0.1. Okay, tell me, given these particular values here, what would you do to find, let's say, the 0.1 quantile, the estimated 0.1? You can make a histogram, you can kind of draw, yeah. but, but I, want, I want an actual numerical value. How would you find that? Because, you, you know, the histogram, you know, by looking at it through a picture, unless you had another, another way in mind, just by looking at the picture, you can, es you can get an approximate, but you're not going to get the actual estimate that results from these 1,000 values. Excuse me? Well, how would you use the CDF? Well, well I have a, I have one thousand different t uh, t minus thetas. How can I look at those t minus thetas to tell me what the actual point one quantile is? So if you if you order the data and then you basically you can find that. Yeah, that's the key. Order it. So I'm going to use, let's say, observed order statistics with this. And you know, which of the order statistics do I want to look at if alpha is 0.1? Well, you know. So I want you to fill in the blank for me. 100. Yeah, about 100, right? So that's it. That's how you would do it. Okay. We will actually end up, this is what I was concerned about by telling, telling you this right now, getting ahead of myself, we were actually looking at 101 versus 100. You'll see why. It's just a, it's all dependent upon how you define quantiles. Um, 
Okay, so, so now we don't actually know f. And we want to take samples from f hat. So if we could somehow take samples from f hat, and let's call our samples, again, the y stars. So for the first sample, we get y11 star through y1n star. That gives us t1 star. And we can keep on doing that till the rth sample as well to get tr star. And again, as long as r is large, this is going to give us a good estimate of the corresponding quantile from, from G, where we're given f hat as my actual way that the y's are coming about. Excuse me. We'll talk about very shortly how we actually do that sampling process. But before then, let's uh, talk a little bit more about this here. So you know we're using t star minus t rather than. Uh, uh, in a misprint. Yeah. Rather than the t stars minus theta. Well, why? Well, it gets in the, 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 the more mathematical reason why we are doing this. It has to deal with something, uh, it has to deal with you understanding what, what's called a statistical function. Uh, and while those two words in that, that, I guess, that phrase sound familiar, I would imagine that probably almost all of you have never heard of statistical functions themselves. And what a statistical function is, is you can think of it as kind of an algorithm for how to calculate a particular parameter, let's say. And so, for example, if I'm interested in the mean of a population, and I know what f is, and let's say y has a continuous distribution to it, well, you know that then the mean, let's say it's theta, is the integral of y times f of y dy. Well, if I were to write this in terms of a statistical function then, this is my statistical function, t of f. And essentially what that function tells me is that as a function of f itself, how would one actually calculate a mean in this case? If I think of it in terms of, let's say, if y was a discrete random variable, then this t of f then would be as you would expect the sum over all possible values of y of y times f of y. Of course this f of y then would be the probability big y is equal to little y. Well what happens though with f hat in there instead? So I plug f hat into my statistical function. Well is f hat uh, corresponding to a continuous or discrete distribution? Remember plots that you saw of f hat before. What do we call that? those plots that we saw? What did it look like? A step function? Okay. So is f hat then a discrete or continuous distribution? Discrete. So we would probably want to use something like this then when I'm calculating t of f hat. And so then that probability that we saw before becomes 1 over n. Because we have n observations. If you remember that step function that we saw, each step essentially goes up by 1 over n. As, as long as, um, obviously, if you have duplicates, duplicate values of y in your sample, that, that could change. You, know, you might have 2 over n. But generally speaking, it would be 1 over n. And in fact, if you were to still take the sum over all possible values of y individually, what you get then for t of f hat then would be 1 over n times the sum of all, of all the y's. And that ends up being y bar. So then, <coughs> if you were to take an actual resample then, let's call it y1 star 
down to y n star. Well, I could also find uh, a EDF for that too. And since it's based upon the stars, we call that EDF f hat star. So this t minus theta that we started off with, written in terms of a statistical function, is t of f hat minus t of f. Then, if I were to look at t star minus t, I plug in, you could say the next level down, to some respect, I plug in t of f hat star and f hat itself, and that's why I have t star minus t there. So, again, we work with t star minus t rather than t star minus theta, simply due to the plug-in principle. Okay, now how do we actually perform the resampling? There's two different ways to think about it. I'm going to talk about the least or the less common way to think about it first because actually I think it's better. So remember that y1 through yn will be observed values from a, and this is key, a random sample uh, from f. Okay? Thus every possible value of y that we could have has an equal probability of being chosen in our sample. You know, definition essentially of a random sample. Now I need to take a, a sample from f hat. This needs to also be a random sample as well to basically emulate what you had with um, taking a sample from the original population. And we call this sample from f hat a resample. Because how did we form f hat to begin with? That was my original sample. So y1 star through yn star is what's called a resample. And essentially, when you have values y1 through yn, you're putting a probability of 1 over n on each of them. You know, don't, don't worry about any poss possibility of getting duplicates in terms of you know, the actual um, you know, y1 might be 2, y3 might be 2 as well. Okay, Don't worry about that. Suppose I have n distinct y's, and uh, each one essentially has a, has a probability of 1 over n. Because of that, then, you can think of this in terms of a multinomial distribution. You have n categories. Each of the categories has a probability of 1 over n associated with it. So to take a resample, all I need to do is take a sample from a multinomial distribution with n categories with each categories having a probability of 1 over n. So because of that then, you maybe, for example, you might observe something like this as your <coughs> resample. Where what this is saying is that y1 was observed zero times, y2 was observed zero times, y3 in my resample was observed three, I'm sorry, was observed twice. yn was observed once. So in the end, y1 star perhaps might be yn because of this right up here. y2 star perhaps could be y3. y3 star could be y5. Oops. y4 star could be y3 because remember we, had, we observed two y3s and so on. So to take a resample, take advantage of essentially a multinomial distribution. So like I said, that's the, the, there's two different ways that you can think of, of resampling. This is the less uh, frequently thought of way. This is actually a better way to think about it in terms of doing some theoretical deprivations because you, you have this distribution to work with. Now the more the more, uh, I guess, thought of way of taking a resample that's equivalent is simply sample with replacement from y1 through yn. That's it. Sample with replacement from, uh, from y1 through yn. Any questions about the connection, though, with the multinomial distribution, how they, how they are equivalent? 
Well, in this particular realization, let's say, okay. I did not. Yeah. Okay. So in the, in the next time that you take a resample, perhaps you could. So isn't the next resample based on the Y1 hats, uh, Y1 stars? No. Okay, let's make sure you understand. So a sample of size N, uh -huh. a resample of size N. So I could take one resample of size N, I could take another resample of size N, I could take another resample of size N. Since I'm sampling essentially with respect to that multinomial distribution, I could get different outcomes every single time. So, but it's based on the original sample, right? Yes. Okay, sorry. So we're not resampling. You're not resampling from the, from a resample okay. from a resample okay. from a resample. Okay. No, you're not doing that. Now you can do that, and that's where, like for example, what's called the double bootstrap comes in, and then the triple bootstrap, and so on. Uh, we'll talk, hopefully, a little bit about the double bootstrap later. So yeah. just to be clear, when we resample, we're sampling from the initial random sample. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And you know, if you've never heard of the bootstrap at all before, and you didn't know that that occurred, and that can seem kind of weird because. It's, and this is what I was trying to bring up before, that it's almost like data abuse, that you are using your data again for something. Um, and, 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 and that was, I think, some of the original um, problems that people had with the bootstrap, just that idea. But in fact, you know, um, you know, through the work that was done in the 1980s and then also a little bit in the 1990s, you know, everyone has shown that, hey, this actually works. And how did they show it? Well, they went to asymptotics to show that as n goes to infinity, yeah, I'm getting what I'm supposed to get. Also, they showed it through Monte Carlo simulation studies that you know what was uh, what was expected occurred. Okay. So again, sample with replacement from y1 through yn. So here is once again my my basic bootstrap confidence interval. And I need to estimate then these two quantiles. So what I'm going to do is I resample with replacement from my original data. I always take resamples of size n if my original data had a sample size of n. And I order my values t star 1 minus t to t star r minus t. I order those. And then what I'm going to do to estimate this upper quantile, I'm going to take the r plus 1 times 1 minus alpha th ordered value uh, uh, from the t stars, and then subtract off t. And then to estimate then the alpha th quantile, I'm going to take the r plus 1 times alpha th ordered t star value, subtract off t. And that's how I'm going to do it. So if R, capital R, was 999 and alpha was 0 0.05, look what happens. I'm taking the 50th T star value, order T star value, and the 950th order T star value. And that's how I get, we get my interval. Okay. So immediately you're probably thinking, okay, why are you using R plus 1 instead of R? Okay. Some people will just use R. R uh, this Davidson Hinckley book uses R plus 1. And it all comes down to simply how you define a quantile. I don't really think it's worth our time to talk about uh, all the different possible definitions of a quantile. In fact, the quantile function R itself, and I might have mentioned this before in, in this class, has nine different, different, nine different ways to uh, uh, calculate a quantile. And essentially what I'm doing is, um, is and what Davidson and Hinckley do, is use the definition that most closely re resembles the definition of an EDF. If you want to know more about it, take a look at Davidson and Hinckley's book. Um, but what we're going to use is what's equivalently type equal one in the quantile function in R when we want to calculate a quantile. And then also you might be wondering, well, you know, there could be a situation where R plus one times alpha is not an integer. What do you do? So, you know, if I did take 1,000, well then in this particular formula then, I would have 1,001 times alpha. 
And if alpha is 0 0.05, well, guess what? I no longer have an integer that would fit in this part right there. Well, what do you do? Well, first of all, make sure you take r so it is an integer, so you don't have that problem. Uh, there will be some cases a little bit later on in, in, in the bootstrap notes where we can't get around that. And, you know, what could you do? Well, as long as r is large, you know, it's probably not going to make that much of a difference if you are taking, let's say, the, and this is not a good example, the 50th or 51st value. If you want to be very precise, and in fact there will be a function r that will do this for us, you can do some interpolation. So look at the 50th value, look at the 51st value, and then interpolate to find some value in between. So <clears throat> when we actually calculate then our basic bootstrap confidence interval, well, we can put in our results essentially from a Monte Carlo simulation and to get these as our limits. Notice that we have some nice simplifications that occur. Notice I have a negative t there. I have a positive t there. Put those together and look what you get. You get a 2t. Same thing for the upper bound as well. So those are the limits for a basic bootstrap confidence interval. It's really not too difficult to calculate. Uh, the derivation should, um, you know, it's pretty simple. You know, on a test, I could ask you, I have actually done this in my bootstrap course before, sh show me how the basic bootstrap confidence interval comes about. And what do you do? Well, just like how I started off with that probability statement, went through some steps to find, uh, you know, basically the interval, and then you plug f for f hat. Or I'm sorry, you plug in f hat for f. So let's actually look at how we can do this in R then. So I am actually, uh, uh, I will be taking examples directly from Davison Hinckley's book, uh, although this is all my own code. Um, just, you know, it's always, uh, it can all often be, be good to, to take examples from uh, somebody else's uh, book because you, while they might not have given you the code in the book, they have at least given you an answer and you can always check your own answer uh, with what they've done. Unfortunately, though, I've found a number of errors in their book that way, too. <laughs> uh, so this, this is their air conditioning data example. And basically what they have, this is actually an old data set, um, I think maybe even published in the 1960s, uh, that involves um, air conditioning failure times on, on, on planes. And the times are an hour. So the first observation here is three, that means an air conditioning unit on a plane lasts for three hours before it quits. Not good. Uh, the last observation, 487 hours. And what we would like to do, excuse me, with this data, is we would like to calculate a basic bootstrap confidence interval for the mean. The mean, you could say, uh, lifetime. Of, of this uh, air conditioning equipment. How long will it last on average? And so then it makes sense that uh, we're going to define our statistic of interest t to be the sample mean. And if I take the, the average of all those numbers in our sample, we get 108 hours. Let's take a look at our data through some plots before we get to the bootstrap part. So I'm going to do an EDF plot, similar to what we did in the Monte Carlo simulation notes. One little thing that I've added here that I should have put in the Monte Carlo simulation notes is this little um, argument and its corresponding value in the par statement or par function called L-E-N-D for line end square it off. So in other words, when you're drawing a line, I'm going to draw it kind of thick here. So if I'm drawing a line here, by default, the way that R draws its lines, it's going to have a rounded edge to it at the end. Um, and if you look at an EDF plot, especially if you have a smaller sample size, that kind of looks weird because you have a bunch of lines that are vertical and horizontal, and they all meet on rounded off ends. And so what I decided to do was I want a squared end to my line. 
It's, it's a minor thing, but I think it makes these plots look better. You'll never see anybody do an EDF plot uh, that um, uh, doesn't have a square in, into each of the lines. Uh, so, <coughs> so this is my EDF plot then on the left hand side. So that's what's represented uh, by the black step function. Uh, what I've also superimposed on there is an exponential distribution. Because oftentimes in survival analysis or, or equivalently, let's say, um, um, uh, I guess failure data, uh, an exponential distribution is often one of the first distributions that you, you try to see if, if, if it seems to be a reasonable model for your data. And so to get that exponential function on that plot, I simply use the curve function, as we've seen before, plot then this, the CDF of the curve, I use PEXP. Um, the way that the, the exponential distribution is parameterized in R is the same as it is in Cassell and Berger. So the mean is essentially, um, uh, excuse me, the, the, the parameter of interest. Uh, I think uh, Cassell and Berger calls the, the parameter beta. And so if I replace, and then, then the maximum I could estimate for beta is the sample mean. So if I just simply put in the mean there for what R calls the rate parameter, rate equal one over uh, the mean, that's how I got the plot on the left. Also, I decided to do a QQ plot. And since we will be doing some QQ plots this semester, I'm going to make sure that you understand the proper way to do a QQ plot. Okay. So oh, let's actually look at the QQ plot first. Just to make sure, we have not looked at a QQ plot yet this semester, right? Okay. Uh, so what we have here on the x-axis, we have the quantiles uh, from an exponential distribution. On the y-axis, we have actual observed values of y. Sometimes people will flip-flop what's on the x and y-axis. It's not, not that important to us. And I'll show you how to qu calculate those quantiles from an exponential distribution shortly. But I think all of you know from looking at QQ plots in other classes that uh, basically we want the quantiles from the distribution itself to be similar to what the observed quantiles would be for the actual data. So in other words, if I observe a value of 100 in my data, I am hoping then that the corresponding quantile from the distribution is equal to 100. And we can see that we do have a data value that's at 100. And the exponential quantile is very, very close to being 100. And so what we can do is then, you know, at 200, come across, oops, if I can draw it across, and then down, we can, th we basically then want uh, all those, uh, the stuff on the y-axis to match what's on the x-axis. So in other words, we want the, our points to go through that a straight line. And we can see that we have a little bit of deviation there. So just from looking at these plots, what do you think about an exponential distribution for the data? Do you think it's reasonable, or do you think you get some big problems? <coughs> I will tell you, my personal preference is not to do a QQ plot and just to look at the, the EDF plot. I mean, what do you think about the EDF plot? Is it generally kind of matching? Yeah, I mean, you know, where's your problem? Maybe right about here. And look at, in terms of the QQ plot, just a different way to look at it, that's why. But you also have to remember that the exponential distribution is quite skewed. It's far right skewed. And so it's often going to happen, even if the exponential works, it's often going to happen that you're going to have some deviation out there, unless you have a whole lot of observations. So I'm not necessarily alarmed by it. And sure, I would like to have it a little bit better, uh, but I'm not, you know, exponential, you know, might be reasonable. Let's talk about this QQ plot some more. So I need some quantiles from an exponential distribution. Well, what, how do I decide which quantiles do I want? Here's how. So I use a QX, QEXP function for quantiles from exponential. We actually have classes going on, unless you'd like to join us. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way to scare, uh, scare undergrads. Um, 
so for my probabilities then that I need to specify for my quantiles, this is essentially where, where I need to specify like alpha, for example. I'm going to take a sequence of numbers from 1 over n plus 1 to 1 uh, minus 1 over n plus 1 by 1 over n plus 1. So this is what I get. So these essentially will be my alphas. Okay. Now you might be thinking, if I have a sample size of n, why don't I just start at 1 over n, go to 2 over n, go to 3 over n, and up? Why do you think I went 1 over n plus 1 instead? Well, follow that. 2 over n, 3 over n, what's your, going to be your last number? n over n. n over n. Okay, what's the, what's the n over n, or 1, quantile from an exponential distribution? It, it's, it's my son Callum's favorite number. Infinity. Infinity, yes. Can't, you don't want that. So, so that's why we use 1 over n plus 1. And this also then gets at a little bit to why you were seeing how I use r plus 1 before. That's why you want to do that. So I have these, essentially, these 12 probabilities then that I can use to find my corresponding quantiles with. And so that's what I do here. So they're stored in exp quant. And there we go. So that's what I would expect the quantiles to be. My observed quantiles, and since the data was already ordered, I could just say y itself, uh, is what's shown on the screen too. So we can see for that last quantile, which was the 0.923 quantile, from an exponential distribution, it should be 277.22 using our observed mean as the true mean, but I actually observed 487. And that is precisely why we saw this dot deviating from that red straight line. So then I use the plot function, and don't, oh, don't forget to do this, sort your data. Obviously my data is already sorted here, but I purposely put the sort function there just as a reminder. Otherwise, if you just put y there for another, another problem and you're looking at your plot, you may think, oh, everything's really screwed up. Well, and you've got to sort first. x-axis, the, the exponential quantiles. Um, and then to put the straight line on my plot, I use a line of y is equal to a plus b times x, where a is 0, b is 1, a slope of 1. Because that's going to give me basically you know, a straight line that goes through, let's say, x equal 50, y equal 50, uh, x equal 100, y equal 100, and so on. And so that's how I get the corresponding plot. Uh, there is a QQ plot function in R that will do some of this for you. Uh, to be honest, I don't like, um, it doesn't do it exactly this way. Um, I don't like how, how it actually forms that straight line on the plot, so that's why I never, never use it. Uh, I, I believe they draw the straight line through the the um, uh, the twenty uh, the the first quartile for the observed data and the corresponding distribution, and then the third quartile, and they decide to draw a straight line through. That's just another definition of a QQ plot, but I don't think it's a good definition. Okay, so the exponential seems okay, so not not necessarily uh, perfect, but you should expect for perfection. <coughs> okay, so how do I take my resample? So since I am taking a random sample, essentially, from my, from my original data, I want to be able to reproduce my results, so I'm going to set a seed number. And then I use the sample function, R. So I say sample, the first argument is called x, that's where you put your data, and then you say with replacement. By default, this will do a, a, a sample size n. So my resample then goes into an object that I call y dot star. Let me remove some of the um, uh, grammar checks. My resample then goes into y dot star, and this is what I get. So y1 star 
right here. 98. Y2 star is 7, and so on. And we can compare this then to our original sample. Y1 star was actually Y8. Y2 star was actually Y3. I can then look at my data, or my data that I got from a resample in terms of multinomial counts. So I use the table function in R that summarizes how often do I observe a number of three, how often do I observe a number of seven, and so on. So this is very similar to that multinomial observed vector that I showed you before, except you don't see any zeros. <coughs> That's because those are left out. So for example, we had a five as part of our observed data, and so that would be a zero. So notice twice I got a value of seven. Twice I got a value of 47. And intuitively, you should think about, you know, especially when you have right skew data such as this, what do you think the effect will be when you observe this, the largest number, let's say maybe more than once? You know, that might, you know, maybe be a concern. You know, think about what's going to happen to the sample mean. You'll, you'll see more about that as we go along through this bootstrap uh, section. So then if I were to take the, the mean of all those Y stars that we just got, I get 144.08. Notice how that is larger than what we actually observed, which was 108. Okay, so that's how you take a resample. It's not that difficult. Here's another way you can take the resample. Uh, I'm not showing you another way just to confuse you. I'm showing you another way because uh, this is a, a good way to think about how resampling is done. Uh, especially because there's going to be an, uh, a function R called boot. And boot is going to be what we normally will use to take our resamples. And so again, I'm going to set a C number. And instead of putting my original data in my sample function itself, instead what I'm doing is I'm going to put in my indices for my y's. So remember, I, I observed y1, y2, down to y12. So I just simply put in there 1 to 12. Do it with replacement again. <coughs> and I'm going to put that object, which I call index star. These are my resampled indices. And so that then, when I use Y and I put in brackets these resample indices, I get exactly the same resample as I did before. This boot function that we will see hopefully shortly, hopefully we will have enough time for it, um, that's how it works. It actually doesn't resample the data directly, it actually resamples the indices. So what will be another way that you could take your resample? So I've shown you two ways with the sample function. I've talked about this other boot function that one could use too. What will be maybe another function that maybe you've run into before uh, that for how you can take your resamples? <coughs> Should we do someone? Excuse me? Well, a random number generator? Uh, I guess it's kind of like that. I, I'm looking for a particular function, especially if you had a categorical class, chapter three. What about uh, taking random numbers from uh, a uniform distribution? Um, like a discrete uniform distribution? Yeah, with a discrete, you, I mean, essentially that's what that's doing yeah. there. Yeah. I don't know if there is a discrete uniform function in R. There probably is someplace. Yeah, I, I can picture it. <laughs> How about use the multinomial distribution? Okay, the R multinome function will we'll do it too. So are we getting the same resample because we use the same C? Yep. <coughs> so let's take more than one resample. Typically, that you always want to do that. Let's take 4,999 resamples from my original data. So, 
To do that, and, and the reason why I'm taking such a large number is because remember the ultimate goal here is to calculate a confidence interval for mu. And with that confidence interval, we need some kind of extreme quantiles. So since I have extreme quantiles, I want to make sure I get a good estimate of those extreme quantiles. And um, uh, so to do that, I'm going to take a large, uh, a large uh, uh, number of resamples. Uh, I believe we talked about this in, with Monte Carlo simulation, but let's, let's make sure that we, you do see why I need to take a large number here. So let's say that this is my underlying distribution. I'm not doing the bootstrap at all. <coughs> and let's say my, my 0.5 quantile, which will be my, my median, uh, so you know, whatever my distribution is, f of 0.5. Uh, let's say I, I want the median. Now, in order to uh, estimate that, then I can take some samples from that distribution. You know, maybe I get here, here, here. You know, I get a whole bunch of samples if my data is represented by the x's. And then, you know, I could just take similar to what we did before, take the median then of all those um, observations. But let's say I want the 0.95 quantile instead. <coughs> Why will I need a larger number of samples in order to get a good estimate? It's not going to occur to me. Yeah, because the probability of getting values out that far in the distribution is going to be a lot less. And so in order to get a good estimate, I need to you know, re, uh, sample a lot of observations so that I do get a sufficient number out there to get a good estimate. And you know, an easy way to see that, if you're not necessarily confident about why that's true, you know, take a sample from a normal distribution and look for the 0.99 quantile. Uh, take a sample, of, let's say a size 10, a size 100, size 1000, size 10,000, and then compare it to what you know what the true value is for the 0.99 quantile. And you'll see that, yeah, indeed, you do need to take a large sample. Uh, so I'm going to take a, a re 4,999 resamples. And to do this, I'm going to do this in a for loop. And I'm going to try to save my results for every single resample in terms of my t star in a vector which I call t star. The quickest way to create a vector like that <coughs> is to use a function called numeric. Numeric, and you need to put the length of your vector, uh, r. You, know, you could use a matrix function if you really wanted to as well. But this is, uh, I think, easier. I'm going to set a C number, and then I loop. Uh, for little r and 1 to capital R, I'm going to take my resamples, just like what we did before. I'm going to find the mean for each of the resamples, and I'm going to put that in the, the little r l element of t dot star. Um, and so that's how you do it. Let's jump on over there. So just to verify, there's my 4,999 T stars. Obviously, you see variability amongst them. I could do an EDF of them. I could do a histogram as well. And this is what I get. Uh, and this is actually for T star minus T. So all that, that the, the T itself does, it just shifts it. That's all. Now, <coughs> excuse me. Now, if you think of cap, uh, if you think of t as a random variable itself, what's typically the distribution that we use with uh, the random variable t in this case? Remember, it's the sample mean. We would use normal. normal. Okay. So, you know, intuitively, you would think then t star should be approximately normal, right? T star minus t should be approximately normal as well, because all that. The observed value t is doing is just shifting. Take a look at the histogram. Does that look normal? It's a little right skewed. Okay, why do you think it's a little right skewed versus left skewed or symmetric? Well, the sample size has something to do with it. Yes. The high values, which, if you have an exponential distribution, you have a right skewed distribution. <coughs> so, you know, that's why in a set 218 class you say, well, you need at least n equal 30 before you get 
normality. I have n equal 12 here. You know, if I did have a larger sample size, I would expect my distribution to be closer to being symmetric, normal line, but I don't. And so one interesting thing then that um, the bootstrap allows you to do is it allows you to make a judgment of, can I use normality with t? Well, take three samples and, and do a plot like this. No, nope, it doesn't look like you can. <coughs> At least not too bad, to be honest. Um, you know, we just get a, a little bit of skewness there. But you know, you might want to be a little bit careful. And so, you know, where, where could this impact you then? Remember, remember we want a confidence interval for mu. How would we normally do a confidence interval for mu? Before, the, before you learn about the bootstrap. You do the old T distribution base interval. What's the underlying assumption for that? Normally, Normally distributed data. Okay. So you know now you might be calling into question, well, will that usual kind of interval actually work? Okay. So now that I have all these t stars, let's actually calculate our interval of interest. So I'm going to set my alpha to be 0 0.025. This is going to give me a 95% interval, given our definition of, of, of it. And so which ordered values do I need? I need the r plus 1 times alpha of the ordered value. Oops. In other words, the 125th value. I can do that also for the upper bound, too. So I need 125 and 4,875. Uh, 4, <coughs> so what I can do is sort my T stars, pull off those corresponding order values. So this is what we get, 46.42, 189.17. Those are the ordered values for T star. To find the actual interval, it's, uh, uh, here's another way you could do exactly the same thing. Use the quantile function. You put in your t stars, type equal 1, and for the probs argument, you put in alpha and 1 minus alpha, and you will get exactly the same thing. Okay, so to find my interval, I take 2 times t minus the upper, uh, the upper quantile that we had from t star. And then for my upper bound, I take two, ta two times t minus my lower quantile. I'm going to put that into a nice little data frame, and this is my interval, 27 to 169.75. That's a 95% basic bootstrap interval. Any questions? Okay. I think that's a good place to stop. Uh, next time what we will do is talk about how to use the boot package. Again, that's going to give you an automated way to somewhat do this kind of stuff. But again, it's good to know, you know how the boot function is working, how some of the other functions in the package are working so that you have an idea of well, what's going on behind the scenes. Because after all, you're stat majors, you're not some other major in another subject where it doesn't maybe matter as much. <coughs> okay, that's it for today.